lunar missions. We've got a whole bunch of those. Most of this is updates. The big one is the Chinese launched their big lunar mission. Now, this is a robot to land on the far side of the moon. Now, they've done this. It's actually that exact same lander that I'm showing in the picture there was Chang'e 5. That one worked. This is essentially supposed to be a duplicate of that. It was sort of the backup if the other one failed, but this one succeeded. So they decided this one they're sending to the far side instead of to the near side. Now, they had also visited the far side before, but they never did sample return. And this one's going to do a, kind of a combination of everything. Far side, sample return, which is something that actually we've never done except with people you know, years and years ago. It takes a lot more sophisticated automation to actually make all this work. So far side, near the South Pole. Now, it turned out there was a surprise. They saw in some recent pictures that, oh, there's probably a rover included with this as well. They had that in some of their other landings. Actually, the last far side landing included a rover, but it didn't include a sample return. So this is just putting all of it together. And they also had a lot of science payloads, looking at a variety of things from France, Italy, Sweden, and Pakistan. The Chinese are definitely trying to get more international cooperation there. And it will return two kilograms of samples, which is exactly the same size as their last sample return mission from the near side. They'll take samples, some from the surface and some down as far as two meters drilling down. And it'll be a 53-day mission. It's relatively short. In fact, they'll take the samples all almost as soon as they land and get that out of the way. So the timeline here is they just launched it May 3rd. It achieved lunar orbit on May 7th. Now, the thing is, where they're planning on landing, it's not going to be lunar sunrise until May 28th. Remember, you have a 28-day cycle, day-night. 14 Earth days of daytime, 14 Earth days of nighttime. So actually, they're just using that time to get their orbit exactly the way they want it. <clears throat> they will finally land then sometime in early June, take the samples within 48 hours. They take off. They have an ascender. The top part of the lander you're seeing there, that thing there, that's the ascender. That's what goes back up. So it goes back up and meets the orbiter, which the whole system had detached from earlier, and dock with it. It'd take about two days to get to that. Then they'd get rid of this ascender. They don't want to take that all the way back to Earth. Then we return to Earth. Now that thing then drops off a separate little capsule containing the samples there. They release that somewhere on land. They still have fuel left on that orbiter, so they'll send it somewhere else. They did that last time, too. They've typically sent these things to various other places, so try to get as much use as they can out of the craft. So it's actually relatively sophisticated. In a lot of ways, it's done kind of like the Apollo missions were, where you have the same kind of complexity, where you have an orbiter and something detaches to go down to the surface, and then something detaches from that to go back up. Something is sent back to Earth, and it detaches and goes down to the ground on Earth. Same basic idea. But they made it work all automated. Okay, some other ones. We've talked about the Japanese Slim Lander before, so I'm not going to rehash much of it, just that it landed upside down. The solar cells were facing west, so they couldn't get any sunlight in the morning. They only had a little bit of time in the afternoon. And it survived two nights. Well, it, it just survived another lunar night. They didn't expect that. So actually now people are thinking, well, there must be some lessons here. You know, why the heck is this thing surviving? Most of the electronics really die, in particular batteries and that kind of thing. They just die going through all that cold for such long periods of time. Okay, another one. This is a much bigger project, Orion spacecraft. Now, this is what's going up with the Artemis program when we land astronauts on the moon. Artemis is a program for doing that. And this is the spacecraft that will carry them. In particular, it takes them on the launch from Earth up to lunar orbit. And then at that point, it meets up with the human landing system, which happens to be either SpaceX or Blue Origin. That goes down to the moon. They come back up, transfer back to this, and this comes back to Earth. So that's pretty crucial to the current plans that they have for Artemis. And just to set the tone on what the parts are, the craft itself, on the far right-hand side there, it has the basic capsule and it has a service module, pretty much like Starliner, same basic kind of a design. And that's the kind of thing that will get discarded, only the capsule that actually come back to Earth. In terms of how it's packaged up inside the rocket it's launching on, you see that more on the left-hand side. The very front of the rocket, you're going to have the launch abort system, which is a separate system with engines so that there's some kind of a problem on launch. You know, they can fire those engines and bring everybody back safely. Crew modules behind it with a service module, and then there's just various adapters and stuff to attach it to the rocket they're launching on. Those are the basic parts, the crew module, the service module. In the early stages, you have a launch abort system and various protective panels. As an aside, modern crew capsules have done away with this type of launch abort system called a tower, uh, which carries engines above the capsule. Instead, they integrate the engines into the crew capsule itself or its service module. 
so that way there's no tower to dispose of and possibly interfere with successful launches. Integrating the engines into the crew capsule is the best option from a reusability standpoint and hence cost, because the engines are recovered instead of discarded. Uh, both SpaceX's Crew Dragon and the Blue Origin New Shepard do this. The Boeing Starliner also eliminates the tower, but it puts those engines in a service module, which is still discarded, so it doesn't really maximize reusability. Anyway, back to the Orion audit issues. There was an audit that just came out, and this is why we're talking about it now, on May 1st, and they've detailed the safety problems, and most of these were actually known. The real question was, how serious were they? And what they're kind of highlighting is that maybe they're more serious than, than people had thought. In particular, there was extensive damage to the heat shield, and this really matters. We've been doing a lot of returns from low Earth orbit every time we go up to the space station. We come back down, and you're going like 17,000, 17,500 miles an hour, that kind of a speed. When you're coming back from the moon, they're coming back at more like 25,000 miles an hour. The energy that you have to dissipate goes up as the square of the speed. So that says that you've got a lot more energy you've got to dissipate with the heat shield. And they had a lot of damage. So I'll show you the picture later. About 100 places where they said this is way too bad. And there were some problems with some of the bolts, too. There's bolts that were separating the crew module from the service module. Those have to blow apart right before you come back to land on Earth. And they melted so badly to the point where they got worried that you could have hot gases entering and, again, destroying the capsule. And they had some other stuff, power distribution issues. Um, but those things weren't as much of a big deal. The biggest single deal is really the heat shield. And the audit did note that NASA was aware of these problems and working on them. And what they really were just doing was cataloging that, hey, guys, you've got a problem. It may affect the schedule. It took this kind of an audit to bring that out. It's like it was sort of being covered up. Nobody wanted to talk about it. And this is why. You look at these pictures. These are both just pictures of the heat shield and maybe a close-up. There's big chunks there. This does not look pretty. Now, that said, actually, temperatures were still okay. But, you know, you have to worry that it just performed slightly worse. Any one of those holes could have been enough to start eating away and destroy the integrity of the whole thing. So that was a serious concern. That picture pretty much says it all. Okay, so anyway, that's the bad news there. The bolts, they're showing you where they are. The heat shield will go over this diagram on the left here, and you can see what it looked like originally is where the little red circle is. And then this is what it looked like after, where the heat and wind had eroded it away. And, and this is another place where if it went much farther, you risk the potential of serious damage. That's about it. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a list of videos at my YouTube channel, so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.